This video is sponsored by Polygents. Today I've got a really nice video where we're going to look at a basic notion from topology known as Hausdorff. And in particular, we'll look at what it means for a space to be Hausdorff, along with some standard examples and non-examples. In other words, spaces that are Hausdorff and spaces that are not Hausdorff. But we should probably get started with a definition. So, we say that a topological space X is Hausdorff if for all points X, Y in X, we have open sets U and V such that we have these three conditions. So X is an element of U, Y is an element of V, and U intersect V is empty. So I think maybe to build some intuition for this definition, you could maybe look at a pretty nice picture. But looking at this picture, which is probably drawn as like a plane or a two-dimensional space, it seems pretty clear that you can find open sets around X and Y that do not intersect. And as we'll see moving forward, this doesn't hold for all spaces. Okay, so let's get to our first careful example. So for our first careful example, we'll show that the real numbers R is a Hausdorff space. So to start thinking about the proof, we probably want to think about the real numbers as a line, and then put two points on this line. So maybe I'll say this is the point X, and I'll say this is the point Y. And we want to find an open set that contains X and an open set that contains Y that do not intersect. But what are open sets in the real numbers? Well, they are exactly intervals. And so we'd like to do this so it works kind of for all x and y. So we'd probably like to construct these intervals so that they depend on x and y. And I would say maybe the best way to do it is to divide up this distance between x and y into three pieces that are equal in distance or equal in length. And then we can build our interval with this radius. So let's maybe in particular, we'll call this distance right here D, and that distance will be the absolute value of X minus Y. Now in this case, I could have just written Y minus X because we've written Y to the right of X, but to keep it general, we're, we'll do this. And then from here, let's set epsilon equal to D over three. So that means this distance right here is epsilon and this distance right here is epsilon. And from this, we can pretty easily construct those open intervals. So maybe we'll take an open interval from this point to a similar point on the other side of X. So this will be maybe our open set U, and then we'll take an open interval from here to kind of the reflected point across Y. This will be our open interval V. So in particular, we can write u as, let's see, it'll be x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon, and we'll write v as y minus epsilon, y plus epsilon, where we've got open intervals in both of those spots. And now I think we can pretty much just say that clearly we have x is in u, y is in v, and u intersect v is empty. I guess, what would happen if this distance was zero? Well, if this distance was zero, then we would have started with two equal points. And I wasn't so careful with the definition, but it's important to start with two unequal points, and thus their distance will be non-zero in the standard setup of the real numbers. Okay, so this kind of argument generalizes pretty easily to R2, the plane, R3, three space, or in general, Rn. So you can draw a nice little picture of what's going on in R2. So you could take a point X in the plane and a point Y in the plane. You can find the distance between those two points. Then from there, you can break that distance into thirds, maybe call epsilon equal to that distance over three again. But now instead of taking open intervals, you're taking something called an open ball. So that's going to be like a circle with the stuff filled in, but not including the boundary. So we'll take an open ball around X and an open ball around Y, radius epsilon. We'll call those U and V respectively. And then clearly X is in U, Y is in V. But then U intersect V is empty, as needed to show that R2 is Hausdorff. 
Okay, so now that we've got some intuition built as well as some examples, let's look at a classic non-example. For our classic non-example, we're gonna look at something called the line with two origins. So there's a little bit of work to construct this, but I think it's not so hard to follow. So let's take two copies of R. So I'll say here's R and here's R. This is our real numbers. And then this is our real numbers. And then maybe here we'll put zero here and zero here. So we've got the origin in each of those copies of R. And then I'm gonna subscript this a little bit just for notation. And I'm gonna call this R sub A. So this is like the A copy of the real numbers. And this is the B copy of the real numbers. And then this would be the A copy of the origin, so zero sub A. And this would be the B copy of the origin, zero sub B. And then from here, we'll take these two real lines and we'll glue them together, but we will not glue them together everywhere. We'll glue them together everywhere except the origin. So if you wanna get fancy, this is like defining an, equivalent, a, an equivalence relation, which I'll call tilde, on the set RA union RB. And so what that does is it sets x sub a is related to x sub b if x is not equal to zero, but then x sub a is not related to x sub b if x is equal to zero. But while that's the careful way to do it, I think the best way to intuitively think about it is that you're gluing these two lines together everywhere except the origin, which leaves you with a picture like this. So after gluing everything together, we've got something that looks like a single line, except something weird is happening at the origin. We've got two origins. That's why it's called the line with two origins. Now, what we'd really like for our purposes here, which is to show that this is not Hausdorff, is to see what happens to neighborhoods or open sets containing each of these origins. And maybe the best way to look at that is to see what happens as you do the gluing process. And as you can see, as you glue an interval containing the origin 0a, you'll end up with something like this. So maybe I'll shade just above, and then it goes through 0a, and then it ends over here. Whereas if you take an open set containing 0b, and squeeze those together or glue those together, you get something a little bit different. So again, for the picture here, I'll shade below, but you can really think about this shading as happening on the line. Then it goes through zero B, and then it continues on this way. Okay, so now that we've got kind of a graphical representation of what's happening, let's write down a careful proof. So let's suppose that 0a is in u and 0b, the other origin, is in our open set. And then just by the nature of what's happening in the real numbers, that tells us that there exists an epsilon a bigger than 0 such that this kind of glued together interval, which I'll call minus epsilon 0 a up to zero union, this zero a union zero up to epsilon a is a subset of u. And here, of course, if you're not up to exactly the origin, then we can just write zero because this is infinitely close to zero a and zero b. So if we were to draw a picture of this epsilon neighborhood, it would look something like this. So it would start here, I guess that would be an open circle. It would go through zero A and then it would end here. Okay, so now let's do the same kind of thing using something going through zero B. So that means that there's going to be something I'll call an epsilon B bigger than zero, such that the open interval from epsilon A up to zero, or epsilon B I should say, union, the B origin, union zero up to epsilon B is totally contained in Z. So a picture of, of that would look something like this. So we've got the interval starting here, contains zero B, and then it ends there. And these types of intervals are guaranteed by the structure of the real numbers, like what's happening before the gluing. Okay, next let's take just epsilon to be the minimum of epsilon a and epsilon b. 
and then we'll notice that this uh, neighborhood or open set minus epsilon to zero union zero up to epsilon is going to be contained in u intersect v which is a problem because this guy right here is most definitely not empty which tells us that u intersect v is also not the empty set okay so let's reiterate what happened here we took an arbitrary open set containing 0a, an arbitrary open set containing 0b. From the structure of the real numbers, we were able to get these epsilon neighborhoods of 0a and 0b that were contained in u and v. Then we essentially intersected these epsilon neighborhoods using this minimum function here to get something inside of u intersect v, meaning that u intersect v was non-empty. But then, because u and v were arbitrary open sets of 0a and 0b, and they're non-empty, that tells us that this, that tells us that this space is indeed not Hausdorff. And that's a good place to stop. Now I'd like to talk about the very exciting sponsor for today's video, Polygents. Polygents is an online research academy started by a Stanford PhD. Polygents is dedicated to pairing driven students with top tier academics and practitioners for one-to-one -one mentorship. This is a fantastic opportunity for high school students to dive deep into a topic of their interest while being guided by a mentor who is an expert in their field. I'm particularly excited about Ahmet's project about quantum algorithms. In fact, I have linked their review paper below if you want to check it out. Out. It is currently being edited for publication. And this is not out of the ordinary. Many projects through Polygents have led to publication of books or research papers, while other projects have led to the production of podcasts or documentaries. Polygents is an excellent opportunity to get an early jump start into the world of research. Use my link below for $250 off your Polygents program. Get paired with an expert mentor in your industry of choice to make your passion project a reality. And once more, I'd like to thank Polygents for sponsoring today's video.